This episode I'm joined by David Sorensen, who is the senior editor of the Duke Edinburgh edition of the Collected Letters of Thomas and Jane Welsh Carlyle. Alongside editing various other Thomas Carlyle texts, such as the Oxford Unity Press versions of the French Revolution and Past and Present. And in this episode, we discuss the life, times and work of Thomas Carlyle. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid subscribers and patrons for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support Emetics or become part of the community, please find the links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, so David Sorensen, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast. Great pleasure to be here, James, and thank you for the invitation. That's okay. So we're going to be discussing the the work and life of Thomas Carlyle. I think he's actually someone who his biography is fairly inseparable from his work. I mean, you could argue that that's, that's the case with all thinkers, but with Carlyle especially, there's certain traits and certain things going on within the, the political and social context, which are extremely important to him. So it'd be the work and the life. Um, but before we jump in discussing... Carlisle himself. Um, David, just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what it is you do and, and how it was you, um, you came to be so interested in the work of Carlisle. Uh, actually, it, it, it was almost an apocryphal moment because uh, it was in the old British Museum library under that, that famous blue dome. Alas, alas, it's, it's all gone. But uh, it was there in the 1976, 1977, uh, was I sitting next to Karl Marx's chair or John Stuart Mill's or Macaulay's or, or uh, Carlisle didn't bother taking a chair and there he was too annoyed by the, by the cataloging. But it was in that room, uh, and I remember the moment fairly clearly that I read his French Revolution. And that was, a, until then I was a wandering scholar, rather unsure of myself and, uh, you know, lost in the London metropolis, a, a Canadian from the, the hinterland. It was uh, it was an extraordinary revelation to me to read this book. It seemed to me in 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 almost a kind of cataclysmic moment. I, I had read the book that would ultimately change my life. And uh, that that was the beginning of my interest in Carlyle. From there, it went on to uh, to Oxford. I was finishing up a DPhil. It had originally started on another subject, but I ended up, of course, veering towards Carlyle's French Revolution. Uh, and after a, a stint in London and Oxford, uh, I came back to Canada and eventually ended up in the United States. And the, 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 the thread was fairly continuous. By then, I had established contacts in Edinburgh and I became associated with the, with the remarkable Duke Edinburgh edition of the collected letters of Thomas and Jane Welsh Carlyle. And uh, the great mentor at that time, my great friend and mentor, K.J. Fielding, was the one who uh, and Ian Campbell uh, sort of sh- shuttled me in the door and uh, and I never came out. I'm mm. still editing the Carlyle letters some 30 <laughs> something years later. And uh, we're, we're within two volumes of completion. So there's a certain kind of symmetry to it. Along the way, there have been editions of the French Revolution, uh, a recent edition just published a three volume very Orem edition, which uh, I had spent almost 35 years working on with co-editors and uh, it was too long. It finally had to end. I couldn't bear it any longer. So it is out now out and available. Uh, but there's editions of Heroes, of, of Mrs. Carlyle's letters. So I've always really approached the Carlyles from, from the editorial point of view, the textual point of view. Uh, but it's spread out beyond then. We operate a, a, a journal, which is... Uh, uh, surprisingly influential, surprisingly to us at least, to, to my co-editor Brent Kinzer, the Carlisle Studies Annual, which we produce uh, out of St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, where I'm actually located and where I teach. So I think that pretty much uh, condenses a long life of of Thomas and Jane Welsh Carlisle. I, I never thought it was a, a, a solo subject because we were fond of saying at the Carlisle Letters that the history of the Carlisle's is basically the history of the 19th century. And it's uh, it's astounding the number of connections we meet through the Carlyle. So uh, that was always a, a, a primary appeal uh, of, of both Thomas and Jane Welsh Carlyle. Yeah, that was one of the things in your um, very thorough replies to my questions, is that the, the era almost feels like a... It feels like that era in, in Vienna, where you had... Yes absolutely yes. everyone meeting up and and when you actually begin to if you 
if you don't know the birth dates and the times that these people are writing, when they all begin to draw in, you realize there's so much working within one one space at one time that it's actually quite astounding. And luckily for us, Carlisle, as you say, is touching on um, every every well, everything that's going on of, of importance at the time. Um, yes, it, it, it really was celebrity culture. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and a lot of people who went to Cheney uh, Row number five uh, went there less of, with less intellectual motivation than just plain old tourist curiosity. They wanted to have a look at the old man. They'd heard things about him. And um, it, it, it's astounding that it became a kind of, uh, it was it was one of the stops you had to make in London, no matter who you were. Uh, and, and so you had people coming from all over the world um, simply to get a glimpse of the house, if not the, the man and the woman, of course, when she was in her prime. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it is an interesting phenomenon that they were, I think, genuine literary celebrities um, and probably two of the most notorious literary celebrities in the 19th century. Which draws, which brings us to the Hermetics question, which is you can, uh, you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room, listen in mm -hmm. on the conversation, uh, who do you pick? But with episodes where we're talking about a specific thinker, we can include them uh, already in the room. So who would you, who would you place in this? Already, already turbulent room because Carl in there. A fascinating <laughs> question, James, because I don't know who'd ever managed to get through dinner with the three that <laughs> I've chosen. But <laughs> I, I thought, I, I, in retrospect, I might have added Oscar Wilde for a little bit of levity, who was a great fan of Carlyle. But I'll begin. I, I think the the for at least for me, the obvious ones were were uh, Nietzsche, Tolstoy, and George Orwell, uh, and and I chose them basically because all three of them uh, claimed to loathe Thomas Carlyle. They were, <laughs> they, they were apostates to the Carlylean vision. And in each case, I think you see uh, the paradoxical nature of Carlyle and his influence. You can never think of Carlyle without thinking of paradox. He, was, he liked to think of himself as a paradoxical philosopher. And these three, I think, summarize the extent of contradiction that's built into Carlyle's life and his, his vision. And I think let's begin with Nietzsche because nobody was more scathing about Carlyle than Nietzsche. And of course, the famous quip was, and I'll paraphrase, was that he was uh, an atheist, but he didn't have the courage of his conviction to admit that he was an atheist. And this is a, 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 a theme that Nietzsche pursues in a number of different works in The Twilight of the Idols, for example. He, he lashes out at Carlyle. Carlyle, in a sense, irritates him more than any other figure in the 19th century, because I think if, if Nietzsche could imagine him had he renounced religion, then he would have been, in a sense, a precursor of, of or a contemporary of Nietzsche. I don't know if the world could do with two Nietzsches or two Carlyles. I think one huh. one of each is enough. But uh, in any event, it, it 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 it's a it's a fascinating area to begin with because, first of all, I think it, it does show you the difference between Germany and England. That comment is is a beautiful, in a sense, bridge. It shows you that they're on different sides of the river because uh, Carlyle's uh, atheism, which I think it was, I think Nietzsche is quite correct in the sense that Carlyle could not believe, but the fact that he could not believe was the source of, of great creative energy, great imaginative and intellectual energy for him, as it was for so many uh, English writers. We think of George Eliot, for example, but Nietzsche just couldn't tolerate this this slightly nebulous area uh, between belief and unbelief, uh, which seemed to him to be dishonest. Whereas from the English perspective and particularly from Carlyle's perspective, it was the foundation, I think, of all of his, his uh, rather dynamic and linguistic energy, this, this pursuit of belief, knowing that the foundation on which he had been raised was, was broken and could never be repaired. Uh, and and so that itself would generate some extraordinary conversation at that dinner table, I think, between Nietzsche and Carlyle. My second pick, Tolstoy, again, uh, you think of War and Peace, uh, which uh, one of his translators, Rosemary Edmonds, has, has claimed was, was really a, a, a book directed against Carlyle, and particularly in the figure of Napoleon. 
as he, as he is represented by Tolstoy in uh, War and Peace. Of course, Tolstoy loathes Napoleon. He loathes his, uh, his cult, his, he loathes his calculation, his deviance, his, his, his skepticism, his rather mechanical imagination, uh, and, and his, his, his very ruthless and very uh, mechanical vision of, of war and battle and, and human beings in war and battle. Well, of course, if this is supposed to be an attack against Carlyle and hero worship, it actually seems to me to be a kind of dramatic amplification of that remarkable chapter in Heroes and Hero Worship in 1841 on Napoleon that was written by Carlyle, because the, the glory of that mini biography, so many historians have overlooked this, but the glory of that mini biography is that Carlyle is the first to understand how Napoleon in a sense uh, was compromised and, and ultimately, I think, corrupted by his, his own self-made cult. Uh, and the, the, the preoccupation of the later Bonaparte with the spying, with the memorabilia, with the pageantry, with, um, with, with what, what Carlyle would have called the quackery of, 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 of the illusion of omnipotence, this was a fascinating subject because Napoleon began as an outsider, like Carlyle. Uh, he began really not even as a Frenchman in, 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 in the strict sense of the term. And as this Corsican exile, uh, Carlyle was absolutely fascinated by him, by, by the power of his intellect, and of course, by the power of, of his intelligence to lift him from a place of extraordinary um, uh, and humble beginnings to this uh, outstanding uh, world historical figure. And, and this was intriguing to Carlyle. This was, this, was, this was something that was always, in a sense, uh, alluring to him uh, with respect to Napoleon, as it was to so many others. But I think the, the difference was that Carlyle basically puts his finger on it. When, when does this become the cult of power that it does become? And why does it become the cult of power? And I think for the, from, the, from the personal dramatic view, you go to Tolstoy right there because in, in the pages of War and Peace, I think readers look on with horror as the invasion of Moscow gets underway and the, the sycophants and the, uh, the as Carla would call them, the bootlickers who, who, uh, who surround Napoleon and, and in a sense mirror this, 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 uh, this cult of greatness, um, this attempt to try and claim that he was the incarnation of the French Revolution, to which to some extent he was, uh, to, to a degree. But Carlyle unfolds this with a kind of, and this is a word that's going to come up again and again, James, Shakespearean intensity. And I think Tolstoy uh, absorbs this to, a, to, a, to an extraordinary degree as well in the pages of War and Peace. So that would be an interesting conversation to see the two of them grappling. You have to remember, by the way, as, as Nietzsche and Tolstoy and later Orwell are attacking Carlyle on rational grounds, that you would have the, the sound, no doubt, of his dominating laughter. <laughs> one, of the, one of the traits of Carlyle, completely overlooked, by, unfortunately, by his biographer, James Anthony Froude, was this, this mordant Scottish laughter that he possessed, which almost everyone comments upon who eventually who comes to Chady Row. At some point, he will be lashing out at something, and a moment later, there will be these great sounds of his deep and very raucous laughter. <laughs> what was he laughing about? I, it's, it's an interesting question. Orwell would be my third choice, James, because Orwell, again, uh, perhaps of the three, was the most uh, hostile to, to Carlyle. He loathed everything about Carlyle. He, he identified it almost as a kind of poisonous strain in the romantic and post-romantic imagination that could revere someone like Carlyle. Carlyle seemed to him to be the, the absolute antithesis of everything that mattered about England and the English. So that's a, that's a fascinating case as well, because again, it's impossible to read Orwell. Uh, I think particularly uh, his greatest work, the homage to Catalonia, without recalling Carlyle and, and, and particularly the French Revolution, that there are so many scenes uh, that repeat themselves again and again, 
in the homage to Catalonia that are, in a sense, reminiscent of, of Carlyle uh, and Carlylian, the Carlylian approach to history and the Carlylian approach to, 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 to ideological questions. Uh, Carlyle, Carlyle didn't use the word um, ideology, but he, 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 he preferred the word formula. And Orwell, I think the great, um, the great linguistic champion of anti-formula, the man who could uh, divest that Marxist Leninist uh, uh, jingoism of its, of, its, of its bullying and of its certainties and of its hectoring and all of its implicit violence, who could strip that language down and expose it for what it is. You know, one thinks of that, the, the great essay on the politics in the English language. That's right out of Carlyle. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much Carlyle, the, the, the man who, who, could, who, 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 on the one hand, saw the merits of the French Revolution, the first English historian really to, to genuinely sympathize with the cause of the Jacobins, the first to, to really try and probe the mentality, the mentalité of the, of, of the Jacobins. Um, and, and, and so many times, I think, when I'm reading the uh, homage to Catalonia, uh, reverberations occur in the text. Uh, I, 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 I recall, I think, the most extraordinary moment in the homage to Catalonia is when he eventually uh, is exploring the uh, the now vacated trenches of the young fascist fascist soldiers whom they've been actually staring at for almost uh, 11 months and uh, they overcome the redoots they leave they leave behind their personal memorabilia their their, their portraits of children photographs of, of, of grandmothers of mothers um, of, of lovers of wives and so on and Orwell is overwhelmed by this by this scene in the in the fascist trenches as they're as they're looking over what had been left, because he suddenly realizes, looking at these personal mementos, that they have far more in common with these young. Many of them were just boys, young, very young men. They have far more in common with them uh, than than anything uh, that ideology can separate. That that these human connections come through to Orwell. It's a remarkably tender moment, and for me, it's reminiscent, uh, in particular, of the of the moment when the Bastille is uh, overcome. There are only, I think, seven prisoners in, in in the great fortress, but one of them leaves behind letters to his wife, whom he thinks he will never see again, whom he never does see again, and it's a again a, a love letter that Carlyle unfolds uh, in the French Revolution. And it's a Norwellian moment. It's 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 overwhelmingly Orwellian in the sense that formula and ideology can can be such inhuman forces. They they can they can twist our most precious instincts, our most most precious connections with one another. So that's an example, I think, of of of, of the kind of of almost consanguineous uh, relations that exist between Orwell and and Carlyle despite, of course, Orwell's antagonism towards Carlyle. Mm -hmm. The ones that the one that really interests me there is um, is Nietzsche. I mean, firstly, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Do you think that if, if anyone was to come out on top of that conversation, it probably would be Carlyle? So Nietzsche, Nietzsche was sort of relative. Well, at times in his life, the difficulty with Nietzsche when you say to put Nietzsche in a room is what era? Because yes. near, near the yeah. end, well, what right at the end he was obviously uh, had gone insane but just before that he was um extremely shy yeah so you know we, yeah, we don't no, know no, what I, we're I, getting yeah no i i one you know one thinks of that relationship poor nietzsche had with wagner you know uh, what a terrible thing that is to have to read about the being constantly bullied and and, and hectored and cowed by wagner it must have been a terrible experience for that for that painfully awkward young man to have to deal with the the capital G genius of Wagner, mm -hmm. but I I think I, I think Carlyle would have been interested in Nietzsche. This is this is the uh, this is the fascinating aspect of it is that I, I I think he would have reached out to him particularly because of his classical scholarship, for example, and his interest in philology, which Carlyle himself was very interested in uh, philological research. So I'm I'm thinking that that would have been a um, that would have been an interesting situation for 
for Nietzsche to realize that Carlyle in person was anything but an ogre. He was, he was extraordinarily uh, kind, almost chivalric in his personal relationships with people. And when he was attacked, he never counterattacked. He normally would laugh. Um, <laughs> and after he after he'd laughed, he would he'd give ground and, and he would listen. Uh, he, he was prone to long harangues, but one of the, I think, things we have to remember is that after those harangues finished, uh, it, it tended to be a kind of explosion. And when it was finished, he, he was also, he was very charitable, and very kind. And I think he would, I, I, my feeling is that that dinner, he would reach out to Nietzsche and he would actually accept a large amount of what Nietzsche had said in, in opposition to him. Yeah, there's a couple of things. I mean, one thing that's really interesting for me is um, I sort of like reading crit- critics of Nietzsche because he's often mm-hmm. heralded as this, uh, well, just extreme extreme figure who's sometimes sort of seen as untouchable. But yeah. it seems funny to me that, um, the, that uh, Nietzsche's criticism of Carlyle is that he has found... He's understood the death of God, the death of Christendom, yeah, yeah, but he's yeah. retreated back to what Nietzsche would understand as the comfort of belief. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the the biggest critics of Nietzsche is this um, is an Orthodox philosopher, an Orthodox priest called Father Ser- Seraphim Rose, actually criticizes yeah. Nietzsche of the exact same thing, but in reverse. And he says that in his yes. in his uh, almost devout atheism, he's crying for God harder than anyone else. Um, but yes, it's a fascinating comment, and I, I think again here's here's that overlap because for for Carlyle the the world without religion is an inconceivable phenomenon, and he it's not so much that he opposes atheism, he simply believes in his heart that atheism cannot exist, and that he has no experience as a, as an historian as a critic. As an observer, he has never seen this phenomenon, because if it's not, if it's not uh, religion, it's going to be some kind of religion through a glass darkly, so to speak. That and 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 I think this is very much what he would have seen in Nietzsche. I mean, his classicism, this this distinction, for example, between the Apollinean and the Dionysian, it's fascinating. It's 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 this intense participation in the in the spiritual energies that generate this mythology. And, and this would have, I think, Carlyle would have found absolutely compelling. I mean, if you look at the chapter on Odin in uh, at pagan religion in uh, the first chapter of Heroes and Hero Worship, it's very much, it seems to me, a kind of prognostication of, of Nietzsche and Nietzsche at his, I think, most powerful. And, and, and so the the, the the byways and and the the detours here become extraordinarily important in the relationship between these two men. So by um, by saying that religion um, is then viewed for a glass darkly, do you, are you sort of saying that um, Carl Und- Carl Und- Carlyle understood that these dynamics were still. Um, still there, still behind the scenes, but something else is going to um, yes, commune with the dynamic. Think... Do you think there was something which Nietzsche understood as replacing? I mean, for me, I would understand but maybe the thing that replaced it would be progressivism and, and democracy. Do you think that yes. that would come in and that that would be what Nietzsche would understand as the... This was very much the, the idea that Carlyle implied in his French Revolution that that Rousseau had provided the French Revolution. He was the he, he referred to him as the evangelist of the French Revolution, and throughout, which is an extraordinarily, I think, profound understanding of the French Revolution, is that long before de Tocqueville and long before uh, Michelet, Carlyle understood that the, the the generating force of the French Revolution was not. Uh, economics. It was not, uh, as Marx would have it, it, it was religion. And this is a very uh, interesting and, and I think highly original way of, of, of coming to grips with the French Revolution. And I think that's had a profound impact on French uh, historians, even Marxist historians, because you cannot separate what Carlyle calls the mythos of the French Revolution uh, from the event itself. Those people, as Carlyle was prone to say, they didn't go out in the streets because merely because they were hungry. They didn't go out in the streets and and 
uh, in many cases, you know, do things that were remarkably reckless and brave. They didn't do those things because they didn't have some kind of dream or vision that was, was in, you know, driving them on. And I think, again, the ways in which religion is deflected um, in, 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 in the 19th century, uh, this is what generates, of course, the closed philosophy. We, we talk about that in Sartre Resartus, but the idea that, that this, this process of weaving new myths, new, new forms of, uh, of uh, kind of imaginative self-projection, uh, both, both of the individual and the world, uh, this, is, this is a perennial impulse to deny it or to pretend somehow that it no longer operates. Uh, for Carlyle, this was an abomination. And, and he, he, he really set his life against the notion that you could ever fathom the world without the lens of religion. Mm, okay. Um, I'm sure the, the religious aspects will come, come back in, but moving into um, perhaps one of my favorite sort of critiques, which happens in Carlyle's Carlyle's thought, perhaps it's just because I'm not a big fan of Hegel, but um, Sartor, Sartor Rosatus, um, the idea of a, a, a clothes philosophy or philosophy of clothes and the idea, um, at least as I read it, perhaps I'm a bit wrong, but the idea that um, German idealism in its attempt to articulate the difference between phenomena and noumena is simply just getting muddled in useless abstractions. And mm -hmm. even though Carlyle was interested in this, he is interested in it more in its own processes as opposed to the actual conclusions that it's coming to. And I think another thing to bring in that, that I just sort of am reminded of, especially with regards to Sartre Rosatus, is that it's an absolutely phenomenal novel and is well ahead of its time in terms yeah, of, of yeah. you know, as some people have declared it as, as the sort of proto postmodern novel. I mean, it, it's, I think, you know, you could put it alongside um, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, cl closed philosophy is this. Um, is this simply a critique of German idealism, or is this something something more in terms of a critique of abstract well, philosophy? I, I think there's no question that the 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 the, the, the funny parts and, and much of Sartre Resortis is very funny. Uh, this 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 encounter between this rather pragmatic British editor and this this wayward nomadic German philosopher. Uh, it's it's a magnificent. Uh, spoof really isn't it of, of of national caricatures among other things and uh, and and carlisle is he's he's very adroit in in uh, as stern is he's very adroit in sartre Rosardis because he he's he nimbly plays between the two of them um uh, and at various stages throughout the the, the drama and it, it does become a kind of drama between the two uh at various stages, the, the tension mounts because at, at one point the reader is begging for the editor to to to, to save them from the abstractions of Teufelsdröck, and yet at another moment the editor's uh, his dryness and his 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 confidence and his uh, his his analytical sweep become incredibly tiresome, and you long for. Uh, a little bit of of of, uh, of a Teufelsdreikian excursion to release you from the grip of that uh, overly British analytical tradition. So it's 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 this constant playfulness uh, of of these two ideas, and and yes, of course they are to some extent caricatures. Uh, as far as you know, Hegel and uh, the German uh, idealists, uh, I, I think Carlyle went to them in desperate need of an approach. And I, I, I noticed you very wisely, I think, used the word uh, method and the, the, the way in which they approached philosophy. He was intrigued by this. He was intrigued by the, the extraordinary discipline they brought to the study of what he called the inwardness of the interior. And, and uh, this, was, this was heartening to Carlyle, remember, because from his perspective, from the Scottish uh, perspective, analysis had become a kind of withering form of uh, of thought. It was a it was a life denying form of thought. This this breaking things down into their constituent elements. It was a perpetual negation of life, and yet here with the Germans employing analytical 
methods to arrive at, 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 the, at the unknown, at, 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 at this extraordinary sense of wonder. Uh, it was the same with Kant. I mean, I, I don't think Carlyle understood the critique of pure reason in any kind of exact way, but I think he he appreciated what Kant was doing with with great uh, I think with great ardor. Carlyle embraced this idea that you 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 could use uh, analytical categories, abstract thinking, to get closer to questions that had no answer. And this was this was a revelation to him. This was a this was a, 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 a which he regarded all of this as a kind of legacy, of course, of his greatest hero, Goethe, who, for Carlyle, was in a sense the embodiment of this of this inwardness and, and of this this uh, this capital G genius to to reflect upon every aspect of life and to see this this uh, unknown uh, this this. Uh, genuinely, in the genuine sense of the word, wonderful aspect of creation, uh, as Goethe lived it out through science, through art, through painting, through poetry, uh, uh, even through politics. It was as if Goethe could could not find one area of life that wasn't, in a sense, impregnated with this sense of, of wondrousness, and his mind was constantly at work uh, exploring the possibilities of this, so uh, I, I, I see German Germany was to such a large degree, I think, a, a, an antidote to Carlyle, and and it it, it he he always said that Goethe saved him, and I think he meant that in the in the genuine way that that the uh, that Germany taught Carlyle that the the that that his instincts had been correct. That the limitations of his own uh, very British Scottish worldview, uh, they were limitations, and that he didn't have to apologize, in a sense, uh, for for exposing them as limitations of, 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 of uh, to use the Kantian words, reason and understanding. Yeah, this seems to now now I come to think of it, this seems to be a sort of an underlying question for Carlyle: is whether or not someone should venture. Um, one of the first questions I had written down was whether or not someone should um, try illuminate all the mysteries of life. And perhaps, mm -hmm. do you think that's in part Carlyle's, I, I want to say retreat, but perhaps that's the wrong word because it's a bit defeatist, but retreat mm -hmm. back into the comforts of religion is this finding a way to have a territory that you can still explore, such as re religious mm -hmm. and faith mm -hmm. and grace, mm -hmm. but still understand that there are limitations and that, that venturing towards them is... Um, isn't actually going to be that beneficial for our own well-being. Yes, I, I mean, he always said that, uh, you know, thinking of Kant, that uh, the mystery of the universe uh, was was always to Carlyle, rather like the stars in the sky, one of the great consolations of life. And he mentioned uh, Kant over and over again, and, and, and this, this, this inheritance, so to speak, of of the actual limitations of power. Isn't it interesting that Carlyle, who's always associated with the doctrine of power, is also one of the great poets of the limitations of power and the, the, the limitations of power in, in all respects, the power of intellect, the power of love, the power of belief, the power of knowledge. Um, in, in, in Again and again, even the late Carlyle, we, we see him coming Head first, in a sense, against the notion of the limitations to, to mortal power. And this is, of course, where religion begins. It, it begins with the, with the recognition of the, the limits of, of human endeavor. And, and Carlyle is perpetually poised, in a sense, between those two poles. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, with a kind of Shakespearean tragedy, he Ultimately, I think is 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 drawn into the miasma of power, uh, though though never quite wholeheartedly, and perhaps never quite uh, as wholeheartedly as his critics uh, might 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 wish or might think. So, do you, do you think that with the this this inherent understanding of limitations and the things that we can and can't do, this is the basis for what I sort of read as. Carlyle's perspective, at least towards an individual life, of a sort of a stoicism, an acceptance of the you, the yeah. lot the lot you've been given in life. Don't don't. It's difficult because I think you know, as a fan mm -hmm. of Napoleon, 
he sort of mm-hmm. understands that people can pull themselves out of this. Mm-hmm. But at the same mm-hmm. time, I think he's, I think it seems to me that he's arguing that there shouldn't be structures made which should forcefully turn people into things that they're not. Yes, I, I, I think it, it, there's certainly stoical elements in Carlyle's outlook. I, I think if if he's skeptical of stoicism, it's probably the deterministic bent of stoicism that you know what what will be will be that kind of philosophy, which he he never could embrace himself. Uh, so he's he he's meshing stoical elements in his outlook, but it's it's almost impossible. It seems to me to to uh, overestimate the degree to which confusion, pure intellectual confusion, drives Carlyle forward as a kind of creative principle. It 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 he's never happy unless oddly he's he is confused, and and in a strange way in those moments of his life where he embraces certainty. Uh, that's where the vision is. It, it, it gets constrictive. It narrows. Uh, it, it, I mean, much of what, for example, we think of Carlyle in terms of race and racism and uh, his 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 cruel jibes against those who who certainly uh, you know couldn't respond to such jibes. Um, all of this is is those are the worst moments. Those are the darker uh, demons of Carlyle's soul when he when he narrows. But it never lasts very long because the, the, the there is always the hatch always opens, you know, to, to, to let more light in. He's never quite satisfied, even when he's at his most self satisfied. He's never quite wholly self satisfied, and I think this is what saves him in my eyes. Doesn't completely save him, but I think it it it, it does. Uh, it, 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 his flaws were so enormous, um, and yet he he recognized that that was a part of what it was to be human. That 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 that, that living with those flaws was part of what it was to be a human being, and and so I think in in that sense, what you what you're suggesting is is, is in a sense quite correct. That there there that there is there's a kind of generative uh, quality to his stoicism. Uh, which is why I, I don't think it, it fits quite quite neatly with with traditional stoicism, but it's it's the generating power of of resignation almost that 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 that's always there to pick Carlyle up and drive him on further. Um, it's 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 remarkably contradictory, isn't it? Really, in some ways. Hmm. Yeah, but but at the same time, I think these biographical elements seem to at least. For me, pave the way for Carlyle's um, lays fair political and economic outlook, and of course, you know it needs to be said that um, Carlyle is the the originator of the the term the, the dismal science for yes, economics. Yeah. Um, but the but the quote that I sent you from Chartism: um, "He that will not work according to his faculty, let him perish according to his necessity," mm-hmm. makes Carlyle seem like this extremely um, yep. authoritarian um, Orwellian yep. figure, which to draw yep. Orwell back in. But I think yep. in, in, in connection with what we've just been talking about, it's more in a, of an acceptance of someone's yes. law, I guess. But I think, do you, do you think that that influenced his politics and political outlook? I, I It's a dark streak. There's no question. And, and to some extent, I think it's surely a legacy of, 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 of that Calvinist background. But I'm surprised, in, in, as I as I progress with the later Carla, I'm su- surprised to some extent by the degree to which he he transcends that uh, that 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 background in a certain way. Uh, he he's remarkably drawn to people uh, with whom he profoundly disagrees, and he and they're remarkably drawn to him as well. It's so strange that in the 1870s, for example, you had figures like Turgenev, the the arch archetypal fence-sitting liberal Russian. Uh, Herzen, the apostate revolutionary, uh, Herzen, a fascinating figure, uh, coming to Cheney Row, uh, corresponding with him and, and wanting to be in his company and wanting to listen to his harangues in favor of Russian autocracy. What were they thinking? What, what was the appeal? Well, I think we probably know what the appeal was, because when he would finish these long harangues in favor of Russian autocracy, he would burst into fits of laughter. Hmm. And I think, I think for them, this was refreshing. It was, there was something 
utterly refreshing about Carlyle's outrageousness that, that, that there was a sense in which he recognized the absurdity even of his own views uh, uh, in, in these situations. And I think it's that very heterodox, uh, heterodox quality that, uh, that, that is uh, so intriguing about Carlyle that, 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 that these contrary winds are always in a sense in a state of turbulence within him. And it's apparent, particularly, uh, and now this comes back to sort of Rosario's, it isn't, isn't it odd, uh, I think with Carlyle, how many outsiders were in fact attracted to him. Mazzini, for example, or Emerson, uh, Whitman, uh, uh, I mentioned Herzen, Turgenev. Uh, so many Europeans came to Carlyle. Uh, in, in some ways, I think he meant more to Europeans than he did to 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 his English audience, that uh, which tended to see him, I think, as a kind of eccentric by the end of his life, as a kind of dotty eccentric who had who had just was barely holding on to his marbles, but who was funny nonetheless. But but the Europeans always took him, I think, more seriously, and I think the reason possibly that that was true was this idea it goes back to what we were saying is that he took them seriously. He took their abstraction seriously, even if he disliked abstraction and formula. Um, I think Herzen, for example, who is an extraordinary figure and, and who I think uh, who, who's, whose life is, a, is, is in many respects very Carlilian, uh, he, he put his finger on it when he saw him. He, 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 he saw Carlyle as an enigma, as, as a kind of walking paradox, as, as, a, as a contradiction, but a, a contradiction that abounded with this, this luminous energy. So uh, I think we always have to remember that when we're thinking about, for example, the stoicism, that, that the, the, the stoical elements were part of the mixture, but I don't think they were ever the dominant part uh, of the mixture. Now, um, wondering, it springs to mind his his Carlyle's general character. Have you read um, Ernst Jünger's novel uh, Jungspiel? I don't know the novel. I, I, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but I, it's something I should be familiar with. So there's this conception of the anarch as opposed to the anarchist. So the anarchist sees what's going on in the world, gets involved, does activism, mm -hmm. placards. The anarch is this um, is what the monarch is, but to the individual. So they retreat. Yeah. They see what's going on. They might write some things, but they're not intended in a means to change anything or sort of. And it seems to me mm -hmm. that that um, Carlyle comes across in this way of someone who, you know, the question that, that comes to me in terms of his eccentricity and the way he's directing himself to the world is, did he actually want to change things or was he simply sort of cackling with his mad sort of laughter, more, more, than, mm -hmm. uh, more than laughter, as you put it, writing down his ideas, but just sort of putting them out there, but not in any way to actually really, you know, as a form mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. political writing yeah. or activism in any way. I, I, yeah, it's an interesting point that you make and an interesting question. I, I think that, I, I think Carlyle really believed, oddly, he kept denying it, but he really believed in the power of literature and the power of imaginative literature to change the world. Now that sounds... I think to 21st century years, almost somewhat corny, you know, but um, but I think he meant it in very specific ways. Uh, the process of literacy, the possible, this is why he had such a profound impact on literacy in Britain in the 19th century. I mean, the, the American historian, Jonathan Rose has written very powerfully about this. Uh, it, it, he had this uh, deep seated belief that learning and the process of learning, we think of Teufelstroik, of course, here, uh, that, that learning, we, we always talk about when we learn a new language, for example, it, of opening up our perspective, of opening up our uh, our world. You know, I've always struggled with languages and, and I'm, I'm not not terribly good at it, but it's, it, it's something still that fascinates me and I've struggled with it, but I've pers persevered to some extent with it because I think I understand at the personal level, how learning a language, it, 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 it's extraordinary. It, it, it peels off layers of, of, uh, of barrier between you and, and the rest of humanity. That when you learn a language, it's, it's as if you're just peeling off the, the barriers of, of, of 
of, uh, of distraction, if you like, and seeing into the thing, uh, the Arnoldian phrase, seeing the thing as it really is in itself. Um, this is the power of learning, the power of language, the power of literacy. And I, I, I think he invested language with a kind of uh, revolutionary power and force that it, 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 it could change the world in, in quite fundamental ways. I think he was dismayed by the extent to which people believed that politics was the only, in a sense, channel through which any kind of constructive change could be made. To him, this was a very limited notion, a very narrow notion, uh, a very constricted notion, because the reality is for him, you know, the, the, the son of a stonemason of a farmer uh, uh, who was to be groomed as a uh, as, as a minister in the Church of Scotland, England, the 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 explosion that he experienced uh, as a young man learning through science, through literature, uh, was such a revelation to him at such a fundamental level that he never lost the belief. I think that you know the internal reformation that Teufelsdroich undergoes in Sartor is it really is the blueprint for uh, for for the only kind of human happiness that is available to us. Um, uh, anything else other than internal self-cultivation is a delusion. And of course, in his belief, uh, in, 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 which never, I think, wavered in, in this, this, this idea, this belief, I think, was, was fundamental to who he was and to what he was. And he conveyed this um, consistently in his in his letters, in his in his writings, this this notion that the word and that the power of the word is the beginning of a kind of phoenix-like transformation, not only of the individual but of, of a whole world. So I I think uh, when we see it in in that light, oh, we 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 tend to to forget how important that was to him. And, and of course, we mentioned Orwell. It's, isn't it interesting? Language was so important to Orwell. And if, if Simon Schama is correct in that the two dominating figures in, in Britain in the 20th century, Orwell and Churchill, how interesting, how literary they both were. You know, Churchill was a failure as a politician, both before and after, a complete and utter failure. He, he, he wouldn't have been remembered for anything. Um, mm -hmm. Other than, other than some from some disastrous military expeditions and 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 so on, and and some pretty retrograde political views mm -hmm. by the time he got into his his middle and late middle age, but but it was the power of literature and the imagination, the power of power of Shakespeare, so important to Carlyle, um, that they brought uh, you know to that to that to that moment in, in their lives when when they confronted what they saw as a force that could possibly destroy the, the whole notion of civilization, that, that would destroy the whole notion of civilization. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's language that is at the forefront, um, which is why I've always believed, I think, by the way, that Carlyle would have regarded Churchill as probably one of the, and, and probably Orwell as well, as, as two, two of probably the only heroes of the 20th century for, from his perspective, by measured by his, they were both failures, I think, in some ways, both. I mean, look at Churchill. He, he comes back after his great triumph and gets booted out by the electorate. Mm. Uh, you know, an astounding defeat. Um, um, you always have to love the British for doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, it shows that they read Carlyle very closely. Uh, but it, it, it seems to me the, 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 the that, Again, coming back to this power of language, literacy, uh, the power of the word to transform the world, he never loses that. Yeah, it will always be a shame that um, the sort of cult of Churchill will overshadow uh, the uh, overshadow Clement Attlee. Some yeah, man. yeah. But there yeah. we go. That's um, it's sort yeah, of it's, yeah. it's become a minor figure in British politics. I think this. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's a shame. Um, in what way do you see Orwell as a as a, as a failure, though? I'm interested. In well, I think just 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 in terms of it's it's we, we always have to remember how how much the left hated Orwell in in his in his time. I mean, this is by the way characteristic of all heroes in Carlyle. They have to be reviled at, at some period or another. Rousseau, 
uh, even poor old Dr. Johnson. Uh, I mean, I can go down the list, Cromwell. Um, there's always, it's almost as if in Carlilian terms, you, 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 have to be, you have to be the apostate in order to, in a sense, uh, achieve that heroic distinction. And, and, and Orwell, one of the interesting aspects of studying his life in the 30s and 40s is, is the extent to which he was reviled by, by, by so much of, 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 the, of the left that they, 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 they tended to see him in, in extraordinarily derogatory terms. Hmm. And, and I think Carlyle would have enjoyed this. this. This would have appealed to him. This, this, this is exactly the kind of thing that Rousseau faced, for example, or, uh, I, I mean, he, he, he was drawn to these people. Interesting, I, I, I've been reading lately, I wonder if he, if Carlyle would agree with me. I had never realized, for example, how much people hated Abraham Lincoln when he was alive. He was a reviled figure as well. Um, I mean, there he is with his monument in Washington, but, but through most of his life, Lincoln was loathed, uh, and not only loathed by you know, people um, with allegiances to the Confederacy, but he was loathed by, 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 by Northerners, and uh, he he really was a, a figure of, of mirth um, through his, his these rather sad years before he was killed. Uh, he, he endures astounding insult and vituperation. Um, it's as if. Uh, you know, if he doesn't go home to his wife at night, he has no one to talk to because he really was a, a reviled figure. So, uh, again, what is all this about? This this sense of I mean, we talked about uh, Orwell. What what is this about in terms of heroism and, and and the heroic impulse? I think the hero must walk alone ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, and yet Carlyle's hope is that. By walking alone, others will realize the importance of that action. That 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 they will become important. They will always be important because they have chosen to walk alone. Whether it was Gandhi or Martin Luther King, or uh, we could the list could could be expanded. Um, they they walked alone, and I think for Carlyle, in a sense, it the the, the everlasting nay. Is 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 quite definitely the path that 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 all heroes take, and in that sense, James, I, I think it's what I mean by Orwell as as uh, he could never have been a success. He wouldn't have wanted success in in the terms that uh, that 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 would have made him comfortable. But you know, he he died young. He um, he he was a, a, a to a large extent. A detested figure uh, among the left in the in the 1930s. So if you read them, it is astounding how how much he was disliked. So I I think, in a way, we're, we're talking about the qualifications of, of the of, of the heroic impulse, so to speak. But it all goes back to to, to this notion that the, that the hero for Carlyle is always a failure. Uh, they they can't they can't be a success because success is a measurement of that utilitarian worldview that he so much despises. Do you think then that's where um, Carlyle's reverent attitude of silence comes in with the idea that a, a hero figure, someone who's going it alone, would, um, they, they would want silence. They would be within silence. And within the, the social and political context of Carlyle's day, this is when hobbies are becoming extremely socialised. The idea of solitude yeah. is begun, beginning to be really, really frowned upon as, as seen as not wanting to just have silence, mm -hmm. but to be actually antisocial. So do you think that, that for Carlyle, this is where the importance of silence is, is to actually sit on your own, not be drawn into the herd and sort of yes. outline yes. Your, it, your viewpoint? There's no question that the power of reflection, he invests the power of reflection with a kind of redemptive uh, aspect. And that this is, of course, the, the, the very antithesis of what he sees in the 19th century, uh, as he comes to London from the hinterland of, of the, the Scottish borders, uh, London strikes him as a place that is that that reflection is almost illegal. You know, it, it, it's it's a place, and if there is going to be reflection, it has to be reflection in in very, uh, in a sense, well contained and well defined circumstances. But 
this is this is what immediately hits him when he witnesses this for the first time, this industrial civilization is how astonishingly unreflective life has become. Uh, the, the busyness and the, the busyness itself is a kind of illusion because the busyness is a way of, of filling up the day with, with uh, routines and occupations, uh, of drawing them into a kind of narrative that, 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 that pits your busyness against someone else's busyness and, and, and gives you identity and gives you meaning and gives you belonging. But, but all of this is a kind of feast of shells, as he liked to say. Uh, it's a feast of shells because there's nothing in it. It's, th th there's an essential emptiness to life in, in this, this new arrangement of, of, of society. And, and this, is, this is very disturbing to him. And I, I think it's in a sense, Marx talks often about uh, alienation. And of course, uh, anyone my age, you know, was brought up on the almost on the bottle of um, Marxist alienation. <laughs> but but the but the fact is, it, it's an important word. But but Carlyle is what Carlyle is the person who gives it substance. I think this is why Marx and Engels so so much um, respected and revered Carlyle is he is the one who gives these for me at least these these rather abstract theories that i that, that, that I, I they were very good for writing exams i think uh, all of us remember I, one, one of the great advantages of marxism is you could write a brilliant exam question because you could always remember all of the you know the theory and you could fit everything into it but uh, I, but the reality is the 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 what carlisle is given here when he talks about alienation, and, and he doesn't use that word, but he, when he talks about uh, being disconnected from the throng, when he talks about the randomness of, of, of this new industrial uh, arrangement, what you get is this sense of the absence, the sheer terrify. People are terrified of silence. Uh, I mean, we've seen that, of course, recently in, in, in this hmm. terrible pandemic. Is is is, is silence is is it's really hurting a lot of people because it, it's 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 a new quality. It's a new uh, it, it's a new strata of existence. And and how do you handle it? How do you what do you do with it? It's it's it, that kind of thing. But he was the first. I mean, one one of the most important things about Carlyle, he's the first to to look at that phenomenon, silence, and the absence of silence, and and to to see it both in in real terms i mean in, in he's very good at registering the noises around him and, and trying to block out the noises the, the man with the, the first soundproof room <laughs> uh he, he's very good at trying to block the sounds out but he's also it seems to me extraordinarily astute about what this means what what does this mean this aversion to silence this 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 fear, this genuine fear of being silent. What does it mean? What does it say about us? Where, what has happened to us that we fear this? Do you do you think then that Carlyle is is against the structures which has which have um, made us re sort of revere noise and 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 base our identities and form our identities on you know how productive we are, how busy we are? I mean, this is getting near Mar <laughs> this is getting close to Marx again. But do you think he um, <laughs> is critical of those structures which have um, brought about that social change, which has altered our perception of ourselves towards one which should be busy, should be productive, etc. Yes. I mean, we've, we've woven all of these fictions of belief, as Carlyle calls them, and and they, they, the texture now is is has supplanted the reality, that, that we, we identify the reality with the texture, with the clothes. But what lies underneath the clothes, this is the barrenness, so that's a word he liked to use, this is this is the sheer barrenness of of, of industrial civilization and post-industrial civilization is that there's, there's so much of it is empty and and we we fill all of these these structures with the the, the, the fluid of of purpose and meaning and progress you know it, 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 we we all have our mini wig view of history about ourselves mm. we're making pro we're doing this we're going here we're going in this direction it's very similar to work isn't it I mean he was appalled by the notion that we would identify work with with reward that, that 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 you know why do we work we have that peculiar word now i, I in fact i think i think saw it this morning in the newspaper the, in the ft that was uh, that talking about how do you incentivize individuals and i thought to myself now that's interesting because of course carl probably invented more words in the oxford english dictionary than almost anyone 
but he would have been fascinated by that word incentivize because it is an absolute, uh, in a sense, <laughs> sign of the times that, that work doesn't require, we, we know when we're working, whatever it is that we love to do, we, we know we don't need an incentive to do that. Um, we may need an incentive if we, as Ruskin would say, if we have to go to a factory and manufacture glass beads all day. But we, but we know, uh, each of us knows, Carlyle would say, uh, within ourselves that, that, you know, there is some kind of sacred arrangement. Um, and it's the moment, of course, when we're unaware of what we're doing. We're simply doing it, whether it's playing a piano or fixing a, the, the engine of a car or, uh, or weaving a, a, a tapestry. And the, 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 the tasks go on. But I, I think it's true to say that Carlyle is less... Um, he's less inclined to talk about changing the structure in, in the kind of Marxian way. Uh, he's more interested in what these structures have done to the way in which we uh, re reconceive life. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we narrate, you know, we're all historians, we all produce our histories on a daily basis, he says, and, and how do we narrate that history, and and the narration will give you a very clear idea of 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 the absence of the paucity of, of life in that experience. I think that's very much his response to the nineteenth century. So less less than Marx and Engels on the subject of changing those structures, because I think ultimately he didn't believe that uh, by the nineteen by the eighteen forties. Pardon me. That, that changing structures were going to do anything. He, he, he really had this idea of perpetual feudal serfdom, um, if he had any idea. I, I, I think uh, he, he, was per, he was perplexed. I think he was, and, and, and he got ugly because he couldn't tolerate his own perplexity. Okay. Um, so there's, um, there's certain things I want to make sure we get in, because I think for anyone mm -hmm. who's perhaps come across Carlyle just in the brief glimpse that you would within the 21st century, um, much like many, many authors who I've sort of tackled on this podcast for those reasons, Ernst Jünger, Joseph de Meister will be coming up mm -hmm. soon. Um, there's you, you, what happens in, in, uh, nowadays is that the, the, shall we say in quotation marks, worst parts, parts gets pushed to the front and obscured. Yes. So mm -hmm. the, the writers or, or authors or thinkers get characterized simply under that guise. And, with Carlyle, and you know, this was one of the questions I put to you, and you you said that there is sort of a, um, a misunderstanding with regards to this. And do you think that his inf now infamous essay, "Question Concerning the Negro Question," is why he basically was sort of lambasted from history and just it's like, yeah, we can't we can't go near him anymore. Do you think that is I, the I th primary reason, or is there other? I, I think certainly that and, and Fruit's biography, which which implied that he had been violent towards his wife. Uh, I mean, he's pushed all the buttons in the 21st century that would guarantee you oblivion. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I suppose to some extent, uh, we, we need to confront these things. I, and I, 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 I've confronted them for over 40 years. I, I think one has to be very honest about them. Um, the cruelty uh, of the language that he uses towards the the, the slaves, uh, the, the cruelty of the outlook can't be underestimated, and and he can be very cruel and 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 violent, and 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 the justification for that is is is, in a sense, it, it's dismaying. Uh, I go back to a comment. I think I mentioned this to you that um, a great Dutch historian, Peter Gale. Uh, had mentioned in relation to Carlyle, and he said, "What a what a tragic figure Carlyle is." I think that's what's always fascinated me about Carlyle. Uh, what a tragedy that that he should have succumbed to this this, I, and I don't even think he ever wholly succumbed to it, but that he should have paid lip service to this because it seems to me uh, the 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 fact is the Negro essay is uh, the Negro question essay is is steeped again in paradox. And the problem is, at least from my perspective, is that the slavery is not a subject that's amenable to paradox. It's, it's uh, and I think he realized this and he was struggling to try and, and lash out at the do-gooders uh, in the 1850s with their telescopic philanthropy, you know, looking at the condition Dickens played on this in Bleak House. Uh, 
looking at the condition of, 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 of slaves um, abroad while the English working classes and the Irish and, and the Scots were, were uh, suffering horrendous indignities of the 1840s. And, and this, this, this provoked um, wrath and rage and, and disgust. And, and it's well worth pointing out, as I, I mentioned to you, that he went to Ireland, unlike, um, unlike so many Victorians, he actually went there and saw it for himself. And what he saw permanently, I think, um, permanently darkened his, his vision and narrowed his faith in humanity. It's a Swiftian moment when he gets to Ireland. And Swift, by the way, is, is someone we haven't mentioned, but he's terribly important to Carlyle. And Swift is, in many respects, not a terribly attractive figure either. Mm. But, but of course, we, we, we remember Swift um, because we, we forget him at our peril. And I think I, I, I think I would put Carlyle in the same category. But as for the 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 racism the idea for Carlyle was you know I'm going to to lash out at these uh, abolitionists I'm going to lash out at these humanitarians like Mill because they focus on this uh, with relentless energy because it's easy it's 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 easy feeling and we live in an age where anything that um, is easy is going to be you know welcome and and attractive and appealing so. I think the interesting part of his his uh, vituperation against uh, the West Indian slaves, the the uh, slaves in the American South, is is that he does lose human contact with them. But at the same time, we can't dismiss the fact that, in certain ways, his his handling of the American Civil War. Alas, alas, that we could forget about that. Uh, it, it, it's come back to, to roost because he says, you know, um, the, the, diff the difference between the North and South is that the, the, South, are, uh, the South is interested in, in permanent employment for the slaves, whereas um, the North has embraced what he calls nomadism, part-time labor for the slaves, uh, which is better, which is worse. Um, this is very painful. This is a very painful and it's a very bitter and if I might say, it's a rather nasty perspective that Carlyle brings to this whole subject. But on the other hand, is it so far from the reality of what actually happened after the American Civil War, uh, when you know the the, the so-called freedom uh, that the slaves were given turned out to be an entirely pyrrhic form of freedom, and and if anything, uh, uh, it, it brought them greater levels of of human indignity and cruelty than they'd ever experienced as, 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 a, as a group. Uh, I, I often think of the great American historian, Eugene Genovese, is his book, Roll, Jordan, Roll, and where, where he's talking about the resources that the, that the black slaves brought to their lives through music, through art, through poetry. Um, Carlyle simply doesn't get that. And, and that's where I think for, for so many of us, he, in a sense, he leaves the room because um, had had he had he been able to see them at a at a at a more human level, as he often does in individual cases, um, I think he would have seen the 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 sharp limitations of his his paradoxical uh, rantings about um, slave populations in industrial civilization. It's it's it is Shakespearean. I I, I mean it's oh, gosh do, do I need to mention Othello? But I mean it's it's it, it seems to me it's Shakespearean in the in in the largest sense. Imagine if he had lent his voice to that cause. And James, the paradox again. We always talk about the paradox. Is that I think he was hugely influential. We know that people like W. H. Du Bois, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, many others um, were 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 sharply influenced by the example of Carlyle, despite his bigotry, that Carlyle provided them with uh, a, a blueprint of inner liberation that they always remembered. I mean, Dubois is very astute about Carlyle. Um, I think King was attracted to Ruskin uh, through Carlyle uh, for the same reason that the, the, the nobility of learning uh, and the power that learning bestows on one um, it, it frees you from so much because if you have only anger and rage, that's not going to take you very far. 
it, 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 it's, it's unfortunately going to take you only as far as, in a sense, your opponents will, will allow it to go. But if you begin to cultivate what Carlyle talks about uh, throughout his life in, in, in terms of the development of the mind and the intellect and power of the word, this becomes a very potent uh, uh, message for the beleaguered African-American slaves. And, and I, I think one thinks of Malcolm X, for example, another very Carlylean figure using the power of education to, 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 to in a sense, raise uh, the soul. We're back to religion or a quasi-religion of sorts combined with literacy combined with a very deep and abiding sense of history. We haven't talked really much about history, but I, I, I mean, I, I regard Carlyle as one of the great historians who's, who's ever practiced. Yeah, this, this, there's a couple of things off that. I mean, firstly, um, obviously you, you edited the, um, the French Revolution, the, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is it the Oxford, Oxford, Oxford Classics? Or is it the Penguin yes, edition? Yes, that's right, yeah. Oxford Classics edition. So that sort of would be the, the, the sort of um, go-to edition now. Yeah. But in terms of, historic scholarship with regards to the French Revolution uh, and, you know, the the end of monarchy and the rise of democracy, is this, is the French, is Carlyle's French Revolution actually taken seriously? Is he taken I seriously think, as a historian, I guess is the bigger question. I, I, I think in France, it's largely unknown. Uh, and I think, oddly enough, in the United States, it's largely unknown. Um, I think where it's taken seriously Surprisingly, because England has never been terribly receptive to Carlyle, except perhaps in the last few decades. But so many historians uh, in writing in the 20th century seem, whether conscious or not, to have uh, adopted Carlyle's view of the French Revolution. I'm thinking of somebody like the great Richard Cobb. Uh, but you could name almost any historian. A.J.B. Taylor was deeply influenced by Carlyle. Um, it, 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 it does seem to me, when I look around, I, I, I had a correspondence with Norman Hampson, the great historian of the French Revolution, who, who hugely admired Carlyle. And uh, he, he said to me, one of the things that he said that was very interesting was that Carlyle, in a way, opens history up. Uh, in, in ways that are quite startling and, and, and quite revelatory. Uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I showed to my students a performance of uh, Robert Enrico and uh, Richard Heffron's uh, La Révolution Française, the, uh, the, the film they made in 1989, which passed almost without comment. Uh, it's a brilliant film. And one of the young students asked me, she said, did they use Carlyle as the script? And I looked at her and I said, you know, that is an absolutely fascinating comment because when I think about it, it visually seems to replicate the French Revolution, uh, this, this film in, 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 in the scenery, the, uh, the, the attention to detail, the attention, the attention to anomaly, to anomalous human behavior. It's a remarkable film and it's remarkably close to Carlyle. And of course, students who read Carlyle are struck immediately by the cinematic quality of his, of his writing. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's very visual. He's very tactile. He's very, uh, you can smell the fumes. You can smell the sulfur. You can smell the smoke, the, 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 the blood, the, 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 the violence is almost tumescent in, in, in the book. And I, I think it's this, this quality of, of being there, uh, the nowness of it, I call it um, often, that, that that sense of nowness that he transmits. Uh, Norman Hampson was astonished by this, and he said that Cobb was similarly astonished by it. They didn't like Carlyle because he's not he's not English, you know. He's mm. he, he's he's very un-English in many ways, but they they were drawn to the method. They were they were amazed by his ability to to catch the to convey the the heart of this chaos the the, the heart of the of, of of the mythos as we've talked about it the the hope the despair the pain the rage the the cruelty he's very good on the cruelty uh, it's all there um and it's all there in abundance it's 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 a book that overflows with this sense of history as it's occurring uh, history as a kind of um, mysterious nowness 
and he 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 he's always telling us how precarious history is, how you know the postmodernists love this kind of thing, that that it almost seems to be disappearing at any point. But you know, he holds on to it, and he holds on to it, and it's that very tenuousness and fragility that that makes it so utterly memorable. Of course, his his other great historical work, um, Frederick the Great, which I believe is yep. seven seven volumes. It's a lot of volumes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've been working with Frederick the Great for a while, and it's I, it's I mean it's an astounding book, but it's 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 such. Um, a vast range that uh, it, it 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 almost baffles the most intrepid reader in in in, uh, in you know in its in, in the sheer scale of it because he he doesn't just tell us the story of Frederick the Great he tells us the story of Prussia it's the history of Prussia as well as Frederick the Great so it's an astounding achievement. I think that that trait as well of you know uh, of great scope was passed on um is it through his um yes yeah. uh, i can't remember what it's called but a, a history of something is is yeah yeah his I history of england which that's is the one enormous. Um, yeah something like it goes 30, on and on. 30, yeah. 30 something volumes i think i can't remember yeah. but it's extremely big you you won't have a married life if you read these people. <laughs> <laughs> um but one thing with frederick the great is another it's another it's, it's quite funny that, you know, Nietzsche was put in that room at the beginning. It sort of ties it all together in that what happened to Nietzsche's philosophy um, under the sort of malicious eyes of yes. the German yeah. government. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically of Goebbels in relation to yeah. um, Carlyle, what happened to Carlyle yeah. under Frederick the Great, in which they sort of pull and pick the, the might is right and the, mm -hmm. the authoritarian aspects without really delving into any of the nuance. And do you think this yeah. is why yeah. there is, it's, um, I can't remember the author who famously attributed Carlyle's philosophy to, uh, humanity is a crooked, oh no, that's Yes, the, 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 uh, Isaiah Berlin, yeah, the, 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 the crooked bow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this, mm -hmm. you know, altering the, altering the philosophy to, or the, the, the writing to, to, uh, extrapolate your own sort of authoritarian bias and it seems to me that that the cherry picking the parts of frederick the great to sort of propel any mm -hmm. ideas of authoritarian and do you think this is another reason why carlisle is sort of tied in with fascism of course his prose and the way he puts things doesn't help because he's extremely no um, i mean i i think i i think if if i can suggest the metaphor you know he left just enough on the table to feed them Hmm. And we we shouldn't we shouldn't forgive him for that. He he didn't have to feed them, but he did leave enough to feed them, uh, as as was, was the case with Bismarck. And this is a typical Carlylean example. You would have thought that Bismarck should have been Carlyle's ide ideal hero in the in the in the middle of the nineteenth century, and and to some extent he is. But as Carlyle begins to find out more about what an appalling man Bismarck actually hmm. was. Uh, he he begins to back off. He begins to to think that Bismarck is a bit of a fraud, that he's a bit of a mountbank, that he's um, that he's rather you know, dressing in his military uniforms, even though he he never fought in any wars. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the strutting around in these with these medals and and, and hats and so on and forth. There's a kind of um, it, it looks like a, a kind of costume party sometimes when 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 you're looking at these postcards from from Berlin. And uh, yeah, I think that I think we have to keep a, 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 a fairly disciplined perspective here is that Carlyle did feed them and Nietzsche fed them to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we, we have to confront that and, and, and not and not apologize for it and not um, and not excuse it. But but as you have rather, I think, uh, adroitly put it, the the the, you know, the way in which they were used was obviously uh, you know, for their own purposes, we we suspect that that that, la that there is a black and white photograph that an American Marine took of Hitler, Hitler's bunker, the burned out bunker, and there's a volume on that table. And uh, though we don't know a hundred percent, we think ninety nine point nine percent that was a volume of of um, uh, of Frederick the Great, wow. and. Uh, you know that extraordinary moment when when Goebbels tells 
Hitler that the you know that the um, Germany is going to be saved because Russia is you know the emperor is 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 gone we're saved um, or or that Roosevelt dies and he 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 goes back and uses the parallel of Russia to Frederick the Great that that uh, that Catherine the Great is dead and that uh, the sympathetic uh, in law is taking over uh, and 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 so Germany and Prussia are saved and and Goebbels in his rather comic book imagination telling the the Fuhrer that that Roosevelt is dead that the, 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 the Queen is dead it's it's a remarkable but as my as I said uh, my friend Owen Dudley Edwards said uh, the, the, no, no one not even Gilbert and Sullivan could could pull a line as good mm-hmm. as that one uh, but it's 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 it is an extraordinary kind of you know conflation of the circumstances Goebbels uh, trying to console the the disillusioned Führer with these passages from Frederick the Great, paralleling the fate of Nazi Germany and, of course, and and, and of Bismarck's Prussia, and and of uh, Frederick the Great's Prussia. Uh, these things keep getting repeated over and over again. Carlyle, I think, what saves him, uh, and 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 this is how I think I would respond to the to the point you're making, which is a, an important one. What saves him is is his is the contradiction uh, at the heart of Frederick the Great is an enormous question. He actually uses the word in his great proem to the first volume, and he talks about the questionable characteristics of this questionable king. And though Carlyle strives against himself to produce a version of Frederick that is that would satisfy Bismarck and later on Goebbels. It's it's not the whole picture, and you can see the greatness of this history is that he can't quite bring himself. He's too honest an historian to bring himself to a view of Frederick that is absolutely, in a sense, coalescing with what Bismarck and and later Goebbels will need. And this is the genius of Carlyle: is that that when, when he's plunged into these historical epics. Uh, he's so caught by the tide of contradiction. Voltaire, for example, uh, who, who, who is in a sense the counterpoint to Frederick the Great, um, Carlyle can't. He, he can't let go. He, he he tries to let go. He wants certainty. He wants to. He wants Frederick to be the, the hero, but Frederick cannot quite be the hero because he's not a hero in 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 in, in a sense that Carlyle understands it. So you have this extraordinary wrestling match over seven very long volumes and um it, it's 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 an epic struggle and um I, I, if you you know again if you go back to shakespeare uh you watch almost with a fascination and with an awe and a horror as as you know carlyle tries to 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 create frederick into this figure that he just cannot be and ultimately you know, it just exhausted Carlyle, and it, it, it exhausts the reader as well. Uh, but it's 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 a compelling kind of narrative. It's it's the the tension at the core of it is is the measure I think of Carlyle's greatness as an historian, mm-hmm. uh, because history, after all, uh, there are the facts, as Carlyle would say, but the press of the human imagination and the human psyche upon this material and the way it tries to transform this material is a perpetually fascinating uh, endeavor. And, and I think we, we are beneficiaries in the 20th century, um, you know, of, of great history books. We think of Berlin, uh, 1945, or Stalingrad, they, they're these extraordinary books that are produced uh, by Anthony Beaver. We, 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 we think of those and we, we have to think of Carlyle because the, the, the fact is this kind of history this very human and very humane history is, is I think, his chief legacy. Is there anything key um, that you'd like to add in or you think we've, we've uh, glossed over that you'd like to add in? Uh, oh, there's so much to talk about, really, James. I mean, I, I, we, we haven't mentioned Boswell, and Boswell was, uh, you know, a constant presence in, in, uh, in, in Carlyle's life. I think Sir Walter Scott as well. Um, um, I suppose what we can simply say is this to, to, to conclude is that why was history so important to Carlyle? Because when we lose that sense of history, when we lose an interest in the past, um, we become nomads in, in the present. And I'm afraid um, if he were to come back now into the 21st century, 
so many of the young people um, are lost because they are absolutely without any kind of historical framework or, or reference. And to lose connection it, it is, is part of the spiritual devastation that, that this kind of arrangement of society can, can in, in, encourage, that the busyness um, is, is a terrible substitute for, for this deep sense of connection with what has come before us. Uh, it's not nostalgia because Carlyle was never nostalgic. It's one of the most extraordinary things about Carlyle, the historian, is he rarely, rarely ever shows a touch of, of nostalgia, of homesickness. He he knows things are gone. He knows things are gone, and he says they're gone, and and to recapture them is a precarious, and ag anguishing business. But the effort in itself is an endeavor that is always worth it. It ennobles. It expands. And ultimately, I think it frees us from the press of nowness. And, and I think that's his great legacy. And that's why I think Carlyle will always be read and, and enjoyed by, by people who have this concern with uh, the ennobling power of the past to, 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 to in a sense, um, expand our, our, our present lives. Um, happiness, you know, what is happiness? Well, um, he, as we know, he didn't believe in happiness. But if 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 we are going to experience happiness in any genuine form, uh, that's where it's going to be. I think in 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 his vision. Okay. Um, where would you advise um, newcomers to begin with Carla? Oh gosh, I I think the smaller essays. There's one little essay which I particularly love and it's such a profound essay because in a sense it's a prognostication of the entire 19th century it's called signs of the times and it was published in 1829 i think that is a terribly terribly important essay because it would lead uh i think it leads young people naturally to to the french revolution sartre Rosardus is a is a baffling book and and one needs the kind of preparation but i think signs of the times in in a sense is an astounding work of art uh, in itself. His essays are, 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 are remarkable touchstones for everything he wrote. Uh, in fact, we're producing a, a new uh, volume of his essays next year for Oxford. And um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, that that book will become a kind of stepping stone to, 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 the, to the larger areas of Carlyle's life. But I think Signs of the Times would be my recommendation. It immediately leads to, to Dickens and to Hard Times and, and 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 so on, and I think students once they've taken that road, they 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 don't want to go back. They 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 want more. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that's a good place to finish up. Thanks very much.